please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Kevin Lafferty. I have an idea worth spreading, uh, it's a practical one. Don't invite a parasitologist to a dinner party. Cocktail party, fine, dinner parties. Um, I actually have a pretty serious question to ask you, which is, are you happy with your personality? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, hold that thought. Um, I, I, say, <laughs> I say your personality because I think most of us assume that we have ownership of our personality. I don't, I don't uh, believe in that assumption anymore. There's about 800 people here today, and I'm guessing that somewhere around 100 of you do not have complete ownership of your personality. Now, coming from a marine biologist, that might sound a little fishy. <laughs> and it is, literally. I was studying a fish about the size of your thumb, a little olive drab-colored species called the California killifish. My students and I would go out into the carpentry assault marsh near Santa Barbara, and we'd drag seines through the tidal channels, and the most common species that we would pick up was this killifish. Inside of this killifish were tiny parasitic worms. These worms have a really interesting life cycle. They live as juveniles in the fish, and they mature and become adults inside the gut of a heron. The only way they can get to the heron is if the heron eats an infected fish. Once they get there, they can meet other parasites, have sex. The heron flies them from marsh to marsh. It's sort of a parasite mile-high club, if you will. <laughs> what struck me about this particular parasite was where it lived in the fish. It coats the surface of the fish's brain by the hundreds. And that got me thinking, this is, you know, this parasite is in the driver's seat. And it wants to take that fish someplace the fish doesn't want to go, which is straight into the stomach of a heron. About that time, I had a, a student come into my office. His name is Kimo Morris. And he wanted to get some research experience. What he really wanted to do was go scuba diving. So I had him sit in front of an aquarium full of killifish instead. And I said to Kimo, I want you to think like a heron. Look at these killifish and ask yourself, are they doing things that would attract your attention? So what Kimo would do is he'd pick a killifish out of that school, he'd follow it for 30 minutes, and every time that killifish did something like swim up to the surface or scratch on the bottom or roll over and expose its silvery belly, Kimo made a check mark. And then he'd catch that fish, and he'd count the number of parasites on the fish's brain. And he did this over and over and over again. By the time he'd done this for about 100 fish, he saw this amazing pattern. All fish did some conspicuous behaviors, but the infected ones did them four times as much as the uninfected ones. And the most heavily infected fish were the most conspicuous. So we asked, how can we test this hypothesis that the parasite is manipulating the fish in a way to make it easier for herons to catch? We got a bunch more killifish, and we put them into two pens in a lagoon. And one of those pens we covered with a bird netting to keep herons out, and the other we left open. And then we watched and waited. The first day, nothing happened. The second day, nothing happened. <laughs> the third day, it was getting late, and a great blue heron stepped into the open pen, and it caught a fish. And then it caught another fish, and more birds came. And after 10 days, we brought the nets in, we dissected all the fish, and by comparing that netted, protected pen with the open pen, we saw that there were hardly any infected fish left in the open pen, just uninfected fish. The herons were 30 times more likely to catch infected fish than uninfected fish, and they were much more likely to catch the heavily infected fish. We had shown that this parasite manipulated its prey host in such a way to make it easier for the predator host to eat it so that parasite could complete its life cycle. About the same time in Oxford in, at Oxford University in England, a young parasitologist named Joanne Webster was working on a similar type of parasitic life, 
life cycle. She studied a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. It's a protozoan. And the prey host that it uses is a rat. The predator host that it uses is a cat. Joanne was familiar with the fact that some parasites could manipulate prey host behavior. And she also knew that Toxoplasma primarily lived in the brain of the rat. So she did some very clever experiments because she could experimentally infect some rats and leave others as controls and then look at their behavior. She discovered that infected rats became more exploratory, perhaps putting them at greater risk to being eaten by cats. More interesting, though, was that she found infected cats lost their, or infected rats, sorry, lost their fear of cat urine. Not only were they not afraid of cat urine, when they smelled cat urine, they became aroused. In a hypothesis that she's dubbed fatal attraction. <laughs> Over in the Czech Republic, an evolutionary biologist named Yaroslav Fleger had just found out that he was infected with Toxoplasma gondii. You see, this parasite not only lives in rats, it also infects any warm-blooded vertebrate, including us. Yaroslav always felt, you know, a little bit of an outsider and, and you know, didn't fit in very well. And he began to wonder, maybe this parasite that was in his brain was affecting his personality. Now, you... Yaroslav couldn't infect humans to test this hypothesis, but he did have at his disposal a lot of undergrads at Charles University <laughs> in Prague. And so he had them take a blood test for toxoplasma exposure, and then he gave them psych uh, personality exams. And what he found was that there were subtle differences between the infected students and the uninfected students, and sometimes those differences were different for the men and for the women. Women, for instance, were better dressers. They were more trusting, and they had higher IQs. Men, sloppy dressers, not so trusting and lower IQs. But the thing that was the same for both the men and the women was that infected students were more neurotic. Now look, these students were all within the normal range of human behavior. They had jobs, they fell in love, they mowed the lawn. If, I don't know if you do that in Prague, but... Um, so, they didn't know anything was different about them, but statistically, you could see a difference. Well, I read the papers by Fleger and I read the papers by Webster. I was interested because I'd been working with this parasite that lived on the brains of fishes, and it struck me that this parasite was also in the driver's seat, but this time, it was driving people. I was lecturing in the parasitology course at UC Santa Barbara, and I was explaining to my students this complex life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii and how it has this peculiar geographic distribution. You see, in some countries, like Norway and Japan, fewer than 5% of the population is infected. In other countries, France, Brazil, Indonesia, for example, most of the people, like 95% of the population, is infected. This is due to differences in climate, the uh, cuisine based on um, undercooked or raw meat, and the relationship with cats in those particular cultures. I'd been to these places, and one of the things that always struck me about them was how interesting and different the cultures were, and it made me wonder, if you have this parasite that has subtle effects on personality, and it varies so that most people in some countries are infected, and few people in other countries are infected. Might that explain some of the cultural variation that we see around the globe? Now, I didn't need aquaria, I didn't need nets, I didn't need students to test this hypothesis because there's a lot of data available on the prevalence of toxoplasma around the world. Anytime a woman goes into a clinic, the doctor will give her a toxoplasma test to see if she's at risk of, of passing a new infection to her unborn offspring. In addition, international corporations are really interested in selling the same product to different cultures, so they want to know about the personality types in each culture. When I plotted the worldwide variation of toxoplasma prevalence with personality type, what I found was that this parasite explained a third of the variation in how neurotic people were in different countries. And being neurotic is associated with other dimensions of culture, two in particular. One is gender roles. That's, you know, men do certain jobs, women do, do other types of things in society. 
countries where toxoplasma is prevalent, that is much more uh, prevalent as well. Another one is uncertainty avoidance. Uncertainty avoidance drives people to wish for law and order. And that's also more common in countries that have a lot of toxoplasma gondii. Now, this is clearly correlational. But I would suggest that this correlation is based on the same evolutionary logic that explains killi uh, the killifish observations. It explains Joanne Webster's experiments with rats and, and Yaroslav Fleger's observations on his students. After publishing these results, I was curious. I wondered if maybe I shared my personality with a parasite. So I went into the clinic, and as I was going in to, to, to talk to the nurse, I realized, you know, only pregnant women and people that are HIV positive ask for toxoplasma tests. But um, she didn't raise an eyebrow. I, I got the test. I, a week later, I got the results, and I was negative. And I have to admit, I was a bit relieved, and I felt a little lonely, frankly. <laughs> So I'd like you to imagine next week you get your toxoplasma blood test results and you're positive. You've just learned that in your brain is a parasite that would like nothing better than for you to be eaten by a cat. <laughs> How do you feel about that shared personality? Are you okay with that? Would you like to get your old personality back? And I'm sorry to say, there is no cure for Toxoplasma gondii. You're going to have to learn to share your perspective on life with a parasite. But if your results come back negative, then I'm also sorry to say that you have nobody to blame your personality for <laughs> but yourself. So I did want to end with, um, if you want to stay uninfected, there's three things that you can do. Um, Avoid raw meat. Cook your meat well done. Um, wash your hands before you eat. I know I'm sounding like your mom. Um, and then the third thing is if you own a pet cat, um, don't let them go out and eat wildlife because that's how they get infected in that way that they can um, spread the infection to you. So I really hope that you do uh, enjoy and are happy with your personality. And in particular, now that you know at least the hundred of you out there that are probably infected, that um, it's a, a joint and team effort. Thank you.